Hi, I'm Nick Thomas and welcome back to the Academy of Historical Fencing and more in the series on sword terminology. Today we're going to be talking about the spadroon, which is this, or this is one form of the spadroon. Now this is the sword that more than probably most swords get people really in a flap, probably even more so than the katana actually. Now we're going to look at what the spadroon is, um, the variations of it, the etymology and things like that, and look at how good it was as well. We'll talk about it generally as a weapon of its time. And anyway, moving on. So in short, to give you the very brief breakdown of what a spadroon is, a spadroon is a medium length cut and thrust sword that is agile and fast. That is the simple description. You could also describe it as a light back sword or a light broadsword, and both of those terms would actually be quite accurate. But we need to look into a bit more of a breakdown as to what that means in terms of specification, how it handles, what people thought of it, how they varied, and all of these things. So first of all, if you talk to people about spadroons, the general thing you're going to get is they don't really know quite what they are, but they know they hate them. That's the general answer. Uh, and that's kind of naive considering if you look historically, the spadroon was really, really well loved right up until the end of its kind of service life. Um, and then despised for a short period because the last pattern, this one actually, um, got some bad press. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, controversial right at the end, but up until that point, not remotely controversial and really well loved. So um, anyway, the spadroon. What are its origins? Well, the spadroon kind of sword, which usually looks like some kind of double shell guard with a knuckle bow, and then a blade of medium length, which usually means around what later on with the regulation of 32 inch. They're usually around about that and they're usually fairly agile and the reason they're agile is because they don't have a huge amount of mass in the tip and that's really significant because total weight doesn't always tell you that much about a sword. So you can look at a spadroon of say the Napoleonic period and they're typically exactly the same weight as a lot of the infantry sabers of the time but some of those infantry sabers pack a massive punch in the cut but that's because their hilts are usually a little bit lighter, the blade lengths are a little bit shorter, and so they can have a bit more weight in the blade, and specifically they pack more mass into the tip, and therefore they cut with more force. But the spadroon is intended as a mixed cut and thrust sword, so it's designed to be able to do both, and specifically, and this is the really big point about the spadroon, it, it, work, it emphasizes agility, or what would be called celerity as well in some of the period sources, but agility over all else. So it's not just that it can cut and thrust, is that it gets to the cut and thrust quicker and faster than all of the other swords that are of its day. So when you compare it to these sabers and the broadswords and things like that, it's supposed to be more nimble, more, more nimble, more agile, faster and quicker to get to these, these strikes. Because after all, often the most important thing is get into the strike first rather than getting the most powerful strike. So if you can disable somebody's uh, sword arm, for example, with a cut or thrust from a lighter blade, that can often be beneficial to managing to maybe strike a more powerful blow later, which you're no longer be going to be able to make because you've got a disabled arm. That's the principle. So, the spadroon. Realistically, it goes back, this style of sword, to about the mid-17th century. So, around about then, you start to see this kind of sword really developed, this kind of double shell sword as a military weapon, and at the same time the small sword was also developing, and that is important because sometimes people refer to these spadroons as a militarized small sword, and that is completely and utterly inaccurate. Now there are examples of militarized small swords that you could potentially call spadroon, but it doesn't really tell you the full story because what they're normally saying is they look at the 1796 like this and they say that's a militarized small sword. And the reason they say it is because the small sword has some similarities. Obviously, it's, it has the double shells, the knuckle bow, it's roughly the same length. So they say, well, you know, this is just the militarized version of this, especially as most people believe that the spadroon came into service in the late 18th century when the small sword had been around for ages by that point. So they just assume that it's the idea that, oh, gentlemen used to be carrying small swords, officers did, and they weren't really suited to military combat, so they beefed them up and gave them this, which is a beefed up small sword. That's not remotely accurate. Actually, the history of these two weapons is intertwined, and they run uh, in parallel. So the small swords were really being developed in the mid-17th century, and remember what I just said about the spadroons were around about the same time. So you can find civilian and military swords developing alongside each other in the mid 17th century on that use double shell guards and you can find this overall sort of type of hilt 
on every sort of sword of its day. So you'll find it on sp spadrons, on sorry, spadrons, small swords, hangers, um, broadswords, as in cavalry broadswords, so and cutlasses. You'll find them on all sorts. So it's just a common form of hilt on especially military swords, but also civilian. So the comparison between this and this is really not very accurate, especially when you consider that they, they developed alongside each other in the mid 17th century. Now the term spadroon wasn't around quite in the mid 17th century, but in the late 17th century, the term shearing sword was. Shearing sword can be spelt um, two different ways with the double E or the E-A spelling, but it's the same thing. And the shearing sword is a term that came in in the, the late 17th century to describe an agile, straight cut and thrust sword, exactly as a spadroon is, although they did define it as a double-edged sword, whereas the spadroon is often more commonly thought of as single-edged, even though it can actually be both, and we'll talk about that a bit more in a little while. So yeah, initially the spadroon was called the shearing sword, um, which did define it as a light double-edged blade and put it roughly in the same category as the back sword. So the back sword was thought of in around 1700 as the light cut and thrust sword with a single edge, and the shearing sword was thought of as the light cut and thrust sword with double edges. But that isn't very helpful. I discussed this a little bit in the broadsword video, is that often knowing how many edges a sword has isn't particularly useful, especially when many single edge swords can have a sharpened back edge at the last few inches. So the terminology did, did move on from there. And at this point I'll start to talk about the etymology of spadroon, and it's going to be brief because we don't know. So there are various terms in uh, European languages, in, in Italy, in Spain, France, there are various terms that are similar to spadroon that it might have evolved from, but we can only speculate. So there are some logical possibilities of its origin, but there's no evidence whatsoever, so we don't truly know where the term spadroon came from. All we know for certain is its first um, uh, usage seems to have been from Donald McBain in his 1728 manual, and he talks about the shearing sword or spadroon. So it's the same thing, he's, he's the one that connects the dots for us and tells us that it's the same thing. And the reason the term spadroon was becoming uh, dominant over shearing sword is because it doesn't actually matter whether a spadroon or shearing sword has a single or a double edge. So it makes a whole lot more sense to have one word to describe a sword that functionally can have one or two edges. So the spadroon can be single-edged or double-edged. There is technically no difference between a shearing sword and a spadroon. It's just that the, the one word replaced the other. So they are uh, synonymous with each other. And uh, yeah, so the, the changeover was around about McBain's time, 1728 onwards. The shearing sword term just vanishes and spadroon becomes completely normal until they're no longer used. Okay, so there's that bit about etymology. Now, I said in terms of that specification, they're medium length, that is true. They are, by regulation, in the late 18th century, they were 32 inch, and the truth is they were always close to that. So the shortest things that you would call a spadroon would have about a 30 inch blade, and the longest would have perhaps a 34, and that would be pushing the limits of what could be a spadroon, because after that it does become, by nature of its length, more cumbersome and not so spadroony, if you like. So yeah, 30 to 34 inch blade. The hilts can vary a lot, although double shells are really common, and this wasn't a new thing with the 1796 pattern. Double shell spadroon and shearing swords were commonplace from the mid 17th century, as was this kind of hilt on all sorts of other military swords. And they don't necessarily have to have a pommel construction either, they can have an ergonomic style with a back strap uh, like this one. So this hilt form follows the typical cavalry style stirrup guard of the 1780s and the British light cavalry sword used exactly this style of guard, just it didn't have this side loop here, which is a feature you'll find on lots of spadroons as well as hangers and things like that. So just a little bit of extra hand protection. And you can see here, yeah, ergonomic grip with uh, a, a back strap. So a spadroon doesn't have to have double shells, in fact it can have lots of different guards. It can have extra branches here, so it can almost become a uh, basket hilt. And in, a, in actual fact, there's a lot of crossover between some of the light sort of partial basket hilts, like mortuary swords, for example. There's a lot of crossover when you get to some of the lighter mortuary swords and some of the spadroons, and there can be a real big gray area there as to what is what. Uh, 
but you don't need to worry about it too much. We don't need to absolutely set in stone what is a spadroon because once you know why the terminology is being used, it's very clear how we're going to use it, is that it is a medium length sword that is agile in the tip and it's always agile in the tip. And by being agile in the tip, the balance is always relatively close to the hand and the tip of the sword is always quite fast. Now that does mean that it delivers lighter cuts than say most broadswords, most sabers, not all sabers. Spadroons can be equivalent to some sabers, especially some of the 19th century ones. But overall, they tend to be a bit lighter in the tip, in the foible, that's the last part of the blade, than most other swords. And this gives them a slightly reduced cutting capacity over many swords, but an increased agility of the point and also of just getting to fast cuts as well. So that they sacrifice a little bit of cutting power to gain in, in speed, in agility, in the disengages, in sniping attacks, all these kind of things. So yeah, they, they can have a variety of different hilts. Now, I said that a spadroon can be double-edged. So this, for example, is a heavy cavalry officer's sword, but it's their dismounted service sword. It's usually called the dress sword, but that's not a very good term because that implies that it's only for dress wear. And actually, it's for dismounted service. So it is actually designed as a fighting sword, but not from horseback, but when they're on foot. And you'll notice that this sword has essentially a more elaborate version of the double shells. It's what we would call a boat shell guard normally. And it has the old sort of quillen still on there, which is kind of very traditional. But it has a double-edged blade, short fuller. It looks very much like the blade you'd find on a lot of broadswords, although it's not very broad at the tip. So this particular sword, you can actually find them so broad that you would call them a broadsword. But most of them are like this. They, they might look broad down here at the shoulder or the strong or the fort, but at the tip, they're actually really quite thin. And as a result, they are agile and, and quick. They are very spadroon-like. That is because they are a spadroon. But again, you can't say that every pattern of a sword is necessarily a spadroon or a broadsword. You'll have to look at the specifications because likewise, you can find this 1796 hilt with a broadsword blade on it. So certain Highland regiments did fit broadsword blades onto the 1796 hilt. So don't always look at this hilt and say it's a spadroon. It absolutely isn't. You need to look at what the blade is. And that is so significant. If you look at William Hopers, who, are, who is our best source on how blade terminology was being used, and well, sword terminology generally, is he dictated that realistically, the classifications are about the blade and usually not about the hilt at all. So when you're looking at, is something a spadroon, you're primarily looking at the blade and saying, is it of a medium straight length? And is it basically light and agile in the tip, in the foible? And that will answer the question most of the time, whether it is a spadroon or not, because if there's too much mass there, it's generally gonna be some kind of broadsword, probably for cavalry usage if it's on a hilt like this. If it's quite short, then it's gonna be more a hanger or a cutlass. And if it's curved, well, again, that's going to be a hanger or a saber. So yeah, it has to be medium length. It can have either one or two edges, but most importantly, it is nimble in the tip. Now, we can also get um, light, really light double-edged examples. So this is an example of the 1786 regulation infantry officer's sword. Looks very, very thin. It is very, very thin, but actually this blade is quite thick. Um, and basically in the stock that it's made from. Well, it's not stock because it's, it's, not, it's not cut out from a sheet. But anyway, um, this is a diamond section blade. It's heavier than it looks actually, but this kind of looks like an old rapier. Um, and the term rapier did at times get applied to certain swords like this. Although usually by the 18th century, the term rapier was being used for some form of small sword. Although you'll often find British sources referring to French officers carrying blades with, swords with blades like this as rapiers. So yeah, it does look very, very rapier-like, just a bit smaller. But yeah, so you can find a variety of blades on this kind of hilt, and you might be inclined to call it a small sword, depending on how thin it is, because there are some spadroon-like swords that are so light and so thin that you might be inclined to call them a small sword. If you look at it and, uh, and handle it especially, and you feel that there's no cutting capacity in it, then it's a small sword, okay? So yeah, there's a variety for you. Single and double-edged examples. They can be fullered, they can be unfullered, they can have a variety of different types of hilts. And a few other points is 
if you get to a later period sword, like the 1897, this is the last ever pattern of British infantry officer's sword, it's still current today. Is it a spadroon? Well, by the definitions when spadroons were being used, yes, it absolutely would be, because look at the way it's made. It's a straight medium length blade with a small amount of mass in the tip, and it's agile. It's an agile cut and thruster with little mass in the tip. So yes, it would be called a spadroon, but because the term was no longer in use when this sword was developed, we usually wouldn't call it a spadroon. So we might discuss it in a group about spadroons, but we wouldn't usually call it a spadroon, just because we tend to keep the, the term spadroon in its period, which realistically refers to swords up to about the 1820s and maybe a little bit beyond. Which brings us to an American example. So, the American NCO sword, the 1840. This is um, an Amis from 1864. And is it a spadroon? Again, by British definitions of when the spadroon was being used, it absolutely is. It's a bit French in its style, but functionally it's exactly the same weapon as the 1796 infantry officer's spadroon. Um, and this is still current today. The term spadroon was being used in various American dictionaries and stuff around the time. I haven't seen necessarily reference to the, the military calling it a spadroon ever, um, but we definitely talk about this as a spadroon in the spadroon group because it's so classically a spadroon. So you can definitely call this one a spadroon. And, and it does just about tip into the period of when we were still using the term quite broadly. So yeah, how we're going to use the term spadroon is those swords run about from the kind of mid to late 17th century up until about the early to mid 19th century that are straight, medium length, agile in the tip. There you have it. And the last point is, if you get a small sword that has a blade that is edged, I did show in my previous video a small sword that was edged, and has some cutting capacity, would you call it a spadroon? Well, this is an argument that is held endlessly because you can find various small sword hilts with various heavier blades, all the way up to a full broadsword blade. If you look at some of the um, Epi de Combats, Epi de Soldats, stuff like that, they can be really broad and heavy, and some of them you might decide are a spadroon and some of them you might even decide are a broadsword. So you're going to have to look at the blade and say can it cut and how much mass is in the tip and then kind of decide for yourself. But there is the spadroon for you. And, um, and lastly in period basically how was it considered? Well through the 18th century it was loved by all of the British masters, constantly talked about and revered and they absolutely loved it, considered it one of the finest swords you could carry for civilian or military use. At the end of the 18th century going into the Napoleonic period there was controversy over the 1796 that it didn't cut very well, was too flexible, too weak, that kind of thing. And there were some really bad examples. So it got a bad rep, but ultimately the 1796 sword, there are some really terrible examples and there are some really, really um, great examples. So I could show you an example from this one, which is terrible, which is really, really overly flexible, would cut really badly, doesn't have much mass, the shoulder's very, very thin, it has the folding guard, which is a compromise for fashion so that it can sit flushly on your uniform, but hugely weakens the guard of the sword. So this is a heap of junk and is an example of a terrible spadroon. And yet I could show you um, this, which is a, actually a sergeant's version, so they weren't just officers' swords. This is a sergeant's version that has fixed guards that are much stronger, a nice thick blade at the uh, shoulder, it's much beefier, the balance is further forward, and it, it basically handles and cuts like a lot of 19th century sabres. So I could show you good ones and I could show you bad ones. But ultimately, the concept of a medium length cut and thrust blade is ongoing throughout human history uh, and, and very, very successful. So you will find good ones and you will find bad ones. And of course, various examples of medium length cut and thrust swords were in use very successfully from uh, the basically lightly curved sabers through side swords and back swords and, and all kinds of things. So yeah, you'll find a variety. And incidentally, as I said, this is an NCO or a sergeant sword. Actually for a while, um, infantrymen, common infantrymen, were carrying some versions of spadroons in the 18th century as well, although the hangers were a little bit more common. There's the spadroon for you. So, agile cut and thrust sword, you could call it a light back sword or a light broad sword, but I like to not think about the edges too much because you'll find a whole variety between, um, between different spadroons. They absolutely can have either. But there is the spadroon. I hope you've enjoyed the video. I will carry on with this uh, series and I do hope you've enjoyed it. And please do subscribe if you haven't already.